The topic of today's lesson is metabolic pathways. So obviously, if you're like, what the heck is that? Then we need to first take a step back and examine what metabolism is. So in your body, a bunch of chemical reactions are happening at the same time. So for example, you're breathing. That's a chemical reaction. It's probably the most common example of metabolism that we think of. So you breathe in, breathe out, oxygen exchange for CO2. That's a chemical re reaction. It's when different chemicals are like bonding with each other and forming other chemicals and undergo change. So if you add all of the chemical reactions in an organism together, that is that organism's metabolism. So a metabolic pathway deals with a series of chemical reactions that is very specific. You have a start and an end product, and in that conversion from the start to the end product, you get a bunch of different reactions that ultimately kind of like if you fall down one stair step, you like fall all the way down. That's what a metabolic pathway is. It's like a cascade of chemical reactions that lead to one product. So there are two main types, types of metabolic pathways. There is catabolic, which breaks chemicals down, and anabolic, which uses energy and build, builds chemicals up. So catabolic pathways, because you're breaking energy, you or you're breaking the chemical, you are releasing energy. But then anabolic uses energy because you are building them up. So what is energy? So in biology, energy is, well, in all fields, energy is defined as the capacity to cause change. So like if you put sodium and chlorine together, you undergo a chemical reaction that consumes energy because you're bonding them together to form salt. So that would be a change because you had these two different elements, but then you combine to form a salt. So there are many different types, main types of energy. So first kinetic energy, which is the energy of movement. When you run around, you have the energy of speed. Heat energy is thermal energy, like I'm pretty sure Heat is just heat. But yeah, uh, potential energy is the energy uh, stored in a thing. So it's not the energy of movement. It's like the energy of position. So in a chemical reaction, potential energy is the energy available to cause to be released in a reaction. And then chemical energy is just basically, yes, OK, am I wrong? Tell me I'm wrong. Is heat not heat? Yeah, okay. No, I'm just kidding. But yes, heat is heat. Everyone remember that. Okay, and then chemical reaction, chemical energy is just energy used in chemical reactions. Uh, so thermodynamics is the study of energy transformations. And there are many different laws of thermodynamics. We're not really going to look at any of them, so I'm just going to skip them over or very briefly. The first law of thermodynamics just basically says that energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transferred, like, only transferred and converted into different forms. So when we eat sugar, we turn some of it into chemical energy, but then a lot of it gets released as heat. The second law of thermodynamics. I'm not going to go into that because we're not going to look at that at all. Basically, just things tend to get more chaotic as life goes on. So free energy is the energy available to perform work. Yes, the first law of thermodynamics is also called the conservation of energy. You are right, Richard. All right. So... There are two main types of energy transformations, exergonic and endergonic. Not, and yeah, okay, endergonic. Wait, that doesn't seem right. Hang on. I think it's right. Yeah, okay, it is endergonic. I don't know why I second guess myself. Uh, okay, so exergonic 
reactions release energy and organic uh, consume energy. So would a catabolic pathway be exergonic or endergonic? The first person who answers gets a virtual high five. What is exergonic or endergonic? Is a catabolic pathway exergonic or endergonic? Hi, Andy. So remember, in catabolic pathways, you are breaking things down, so you would release energy. Is that exergonic? Yes, that is exer. Alvin, you get a virtual high five. Yay, OK. What do you mean other people can talk? Oh, all right, let's not be Salty? Is that the right word? I don't know. I think so. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so in daily life, we have something called money, which unfortunately is the basis of our society. But, you know, it is what it is. So in the cells, cells also have this kind of currency, but they call it ATP. So ATP is basically fuel for the cell. And so going back a bit, cells perform three main kinds of work, chemical reactions, transporting materials and nutrients, and also movement, which is mechanical work. So adenosine triphosphate is ATP, and it's the cell's main source of energy. This is because, so adenosine triphosphate, so tri means that there are three phosphates, so the bond between the second phosphate and the third phosphate, as you can see in the bottom left diagram. Oh, shoot. Okay. <laughs> that bond holds a lot of energy that can be used to do work. So if you recall from the first class, hydrolysis is the breaking of polymers to create smaller units by adding water. So... ATP releases energy through hydrolysis reactions. Not going to go through the other bullet point because we don't have enough time for that, probably. Okay, so what is cellular respiration? Cellular respiration is the main mode of creating ATP that a lot of organisms use. We perform cellular respiration. If we didn't, we would not be functioning here right now and oh sorry okay so i was just looking at the chat so there are many different ways to produce atp but the main mode is cellular respiration but there's also something called fermentation which doesn't use oxygen and also produces sugars but it's less efficient than aerobic respiration also known as cellular respiration which produces 686 kilocalories of free energy. So um, if you think about it this way, you know how people are like in a daily diet, you need 2000 calories. So they're actually referring to kilocalories. So uh, 686 kilocalories would be like 35 percent of your daily calorie intake and all of that would come from one molecule of glucose so you're really just breaking down sugar into energy carbon dioxide and water which is why we need to breathe out and why we need to take in oxygen if you look at the reaction one glucose plus six oxygen gas molecules plus or equals six carbon dioxide molecules six water molecules and most importantly atp the energy currency of the cell. All right, here's where it gets really painful for me to teach at least because I'm not good at this. Maybe I shouldn't admit that. Okay, anyway, so redox reactions. So we've talked about chemical reactions. We've talked about catabolism, anabolism. Here is a whole different group of reactions and it deals mainly with the transfer of electrons. So there are two types of redox reactions, true to its name. You have the first type, 
the oxidation reaction, which is when a compound loses an electron. And so if you lose an electron, where does that electron go? Well, it could go to another compound and reduce it. So that would be a reduction reaction because that molecule gains an electron. So I need to be very selective about when I teach because we don't have enough time to go through everything. Probably. I already said that. Okay, anyway. So, so, pro, so hydrogens are the first Hydrogens are the first element of the periodic table, and they have one proton. So in biology, we often call H plus ions protons because they are just a proton and they don't have electrons. But then hydrogens with the electrons, they are very high energy because they are a good source of electrons because protons or hydrogens can readily lose their electron to become hydrogen ions, uh, which is H+. Uh, okay, so electrons usually travel with the proton, which is a hydrogen, and then oxygen is the electron acceptor. So oxygen has a very high electronegativity, which means that it can attract electrons pretty easily in a compound. So in cellular respiration, the reason why we need oxygen to like breathe and survive is because electron, or sorry, not electron, oxygen is the electron acceptor. So it gets reduced. And throughout cellular respiration, there will be a lot of electron acceptors, including NAD+, which is reduced to NADH by dehydrogenases. And there's also going to be something called the electron transport chain. So electrons have different orbitals. And so the higher you are when you're an electron, the more energy you'll store. Because since potential energy is the energy of position, the higher you are, the more energy you'll have in this space, which is potential energy. And then when it goes down the different steps, it can release energy, but it doesn't just go down in one step. There's a series of chains that breaks the fall of the electron, sorry, fall of the electron into separate steps. And so, yeah. So the summary of how electrons happen in cellular respiration is it goes from glucose to NADH, which is again, our electron carrier, to the electron transport chain, which is the falling of electrons, to oxygen, which is the final electron acceptor. So first, does anyone have any questions on this? OK, because that was a lot. All right, so. Looking at the diagram here, it's important to know that the reason why we call the mitochondria the powerhouse of the cell is because it makes ATP and it's where cellular respiration happens. So you see all of the membranes around inside the mitochondria, and then you look at the diagram on the left. This is what happens during cellular respiration and what it's based off of. So this sets the stage of what we're going to be looking at next. So hopefully it's not too confusing. All right. So actually on to the cellular respiration part of it. So there are three parts to cellular respiration. And so just to recall again, the main goal is to create ATP energy by breaking down the stuff we eat. So the first step is the is glycolysis. So I don't know if you guys remember from the first class, but the cytosol is basically the part between the membrane and the nucleus. 
So the place where all the organelles are suspended in glycolysis doesn't occur in the mitochondria, but it occurs in the cytosol. And it breaks down glucose to pyruvate, which is a three carbon sugar. So the pyruvate then enters the mitochondria and it oxidizes so it loses an electron to become acetyl CoA. The second, which is another compound that we'll talk about later, the second part is the citric acid cycle. And this is when glucose is broken down into carbon dioxide. More on that later. Oxidative phosphorylation is phosphorylation is where the electron transport chain is being implemented. So again, the higher an electron is, the more energy it'll have. But then it can't just immediately release all of its energy. So it has to release, release it in steps, which is the electron transport chain. So it accepts electrons from the first few steps and the breakdown of products. Uh, water is also formed in this step. Uh, okay, and then the energy that is being released is used to make more energy, but it's an efficient process. And so that's how ATP is made. Now there's another thing called substrate substrate level phosphorylation, which is phosphorylation, which is different from oxidative phosphorylation. And it's just uh, making smaller amounts of ATP. So not as efficient as what we're about to look at. So I'm just gonna skim over this because this is a lot of uh, information. So basically glycolysis Okay, first, I realized that I probably need to explain more things. So glucose is a six carbon sugar. It's the most common sugar in our body, and it has a lot of uses. So basically, everything gets converted into glucose, which gets broken down into energy that can perform chemical reactions. So the first part of cellular respiration is, again, glycolysis. And this is where glucose is split into th a three carbon sugar called pyruvate. So ATP is made during this step, but it's not as much ATP as the ending steps. So the cell spends two ATP to split this while substrate level phosphorylation makes four ATP. So in this glycolysis step, no oxygen is needed. So that means there's no carbon dioxide that's released. So that means this process is anaerobic. Aerobic. So it doesn't need oxygen. And so that's why certain bacteria can perform it without any oxygen. But even though glycolysis can make this 2 ATP, it's not enough to sustain us in our lives. So that's why we need to keep going in the cellular respiration cycle. So part two is the citric acid cycle. So this is where pyruvate, which is again, pyruvate, which is again our three carbon sugar, is converted into something called acetyl enzyme CoA or acetyl CoA. And so this is the first part of the citric acid cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle. So in this stage, actually, I'm going to use the annotation tool. Okay, in this stage, we, oh, that's white. Can't see that. Okay, in this stage, we lose one CO2 molecule. So that's one of our six that we're going to end up releasing from our body. So because we lose a carbon, we only have two carbons left in our coenzyme A. And so this forms acetate. Again, we see our electron acceptor. Electrons go there. Uh, coenzyme A attaches to the acetate, acetate group, forms high-energy acetyl-CoA. And then the actual cycle part. So, whoa, okay. So basically the Krebs 
cycle is like metabolic furnace that causes pyruvate to lose electrons that turn into fuel. So every three CO2 molecules that are released, then one acetyl-CoA forms. So basically each cycle creates one ATP by substrate level phosphorylation. And then you also have another electron acceptor called FAD, which gets oxidated in, or which gets reduced to FADH2. So two carbons enter to leave as CO2. Uh, yeah, okay, so from the citric acid cycle, basically what you need to do, need to know is that the cell loses two or the cell creates three NADH, one FADH2, three hydrogen ions, or also known as protons, uh, one GTP, which is sort of like ATP, but less common, and also two carbon dioxide molecules. So we have three carbon dioxide molecules already. So, hmm. So just to reiterate, the main thing about electrons is that they have a lot of energy. So they can create, so they can give off energy that helps in other reactions, which is why we need all of these receptors and changes and blah, 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 because electrons will be eventually guide the... Uh, electrons will eventually guide the actual ATP making process. So this is a diagram of the citric acid cycle. Just gonna pause on here for like 20 seconds and let you admire the beauty, if you will. Okay. So cellular restoration part four. So, Okay, so this part of the cellular respiration, the electron transport chain, happens in the mitochondria of Christae, which is like the folds in the membrane, which is why you see the squiggly thing. So there are four complexes or like parts to the electron transport chain. Yes, the circle of cellular respiration, also known, I guess it would be the cell, the circle of life, because life needs cellular respiration, at least humans do. Yeah, so there are four different complexes. You don't need to know this. This is just to give you a visual of like how electrons travel and release energy. As you can see from the left, you start out with a lot of energy and high, but then on the right, there's not that much energy. And finally, electron accepts the final one. Uh, okay, so chemiosmosis is the actual thing that causes, I know I just said electrons are the actual thing that creates ATP, but chemiosmosis, which results from electrons, is the actual thing that makes ATP. So mitochondria, inside the mitochondria, there are these proteins called ATP synthates. And as you probably guessed, they synthesize ATP. So they turned ATP and 1P into ATP. So you had two phosphates and then one phosphate and ATP synthase joins them together. So how does this occur? So we have to look at something called proton pumps. And this is where H plus or protons are pumped across membranes, which creates a concentration gradient. So this is like if you push water, and there's like a ripple effect down the river, that's what an H plus gradient would be. And this gradient is to use to power something called chemiosmosis, which is just basically using gradients to help chemical reactions occur. Because when you have this gradient, you have different opposing electric charges, which creates energy. So ATP synthesis is made out of four parts. 
uh, there are diagrams on the next slide. So we'll look at that. And then, so after all of this is created and the H plus gradient allows the ATV synthase to make ATP, our final statistics are that cellular respiration gives rise to 38 molecules of ATP, which is about 34% of what we eat, the energy is utilized. But knowing organisms, that's actually incredibly efficient. So that's why ATP is nice. So this is a diagram of ATP synthase on the right. As you can see, you have more hydrogen ions on the top. So they're trying to travel down, but then the pumps cause them to travel up again against their concentration gradient. And the ATP synthase molecules move them down, or proteins move them down, which causes it to spin and the ADP turn into ATP. All right, we're not done with cellular respiration yet. Okay, so I have made an impulsive decision to basically just focus on the contents and not talk about any of the molecules right now. So basically fermentation is cellular respiration, but no oxygen. Some animals are still, uh, still find oxygen and poisonous as they did in primitive earth conditions. So basically fermentation is just cellular respiration without the electron transport chain. So it still uses glycolysis because glycolysis doesn't, doesn't rely on oxygen, sorry. Uh, yeah, so two net ATP are produced. Again, for glycolysis, you use two uh, electrons two ATP molecules to create four, so four minus two equals two. And so there are two kinds of fermentation. First, you have alcohol fermentation, which is how alcohol is made. And then you have lactic acid fermentation, which is what yeast use. And also when you're running a marathon and you're breathing really heavily and not all of your body is getting, getting this oxygen that it needs to perform cellular respiration, oftentimes we will use lactic acid fermentation. Yeah, so that's all we need from this slide. These are two diagrams that we'll not be looking at right now. Okay, finally, easier to digest things. So autotrophs are things that can make their own food. So organisms who use cellular respiration, they can be autotrophs or heterotrophs, but autotrophs are the only ones that make their own food, but they still can, but they still use cellular respiration to break down their own food. So there are two main types of autotrophs, chemoautotrophs and photoautotrophs, which rely on photosynthesis or the sunlight as a source. So in plants, Photosynthesis mostly occurs in organelles called chloroplasts that we looked at last week. And most chloroplasts are found in the mesophyll, which is the middle of a leaf. So that's why leaves are oftentimes like very green because of chloroplasts, which has chlorophyll. But then if you look at the roots, that's not really green because there's no need for chloroplasts because you're not getting sunlight. Heterotrophs have to rely on the compounds made by autotrophs because they can't make their own food. Both rely on cellular respiration. So what is photosynthesis? So there are two stages of photosynthesis. We first have our light reactions, which is, okay, so first you need to understand that the things that go into photosynthesis are car six carbon dioxide molecules and six water molecules. And then the plant or the fungi or whatever uses photosynthesis, sorry, not fungi, protists, uh, turns it into sugar, which then sugar is rebroken down into carbon dioxide and water through cellular respiration. So they're kind of like a flip-flop. So first, 
and the light reactions, solar energy is converted to chemical energy. Water is split, which creates a source of electrons and protons. So the electron acceptor for cellular respiration is NAD, and the reduced form with one more electron is NADH. In plants, or in photosynthesis, sorry, it's NADP and NADPH. And so this happens, the light reactions happen in the thylakoid, which we'll look at in the diagram next slide. The Calvin cycle is the actual glucose or sugar making part named for Melvin Calvin. And it's just fixing carbon so you get more carbon. And it takes in the CO2 levels and creates the sugar and happens in the stroma. So as you can see in this diagram, not this diagram, where did I put it? Wait, no, sorry, it was on the slide. Okay, there we go. The thylakoid are like the stacks of things and that's what captures light, while the actual process of carbon fixation happens in the, happens in the space between the thylakoids and the outer membrane. So basically from this slide, all you need to know is that chlorophyll is the pigment found in chloroplasts and it absorbs pretty much every kind of light well, except for green light, which is why plants are green. All right, so the main thing about photosynthesis is that instead of like all of the different electron transport chains and stuff, all of the chemical reactions are centered into protein complexes called photosystems. So different kinds of photosystems attract light of different wavelengths. So there are two main kinds of photosystems. Photosystem two, which, okay, so photosystem one and photosystem two are in the order that the products, uh, sorry, the reactants undergo, it's because photosystem one was discovered before photosystem two. So they like different wavelengths of light. And so ultimately you have a light harvesting complex, which has a lot of chlorophyll and you get a lot of light. And then this goes into the primary electron acceptor which can absorb the light and ultimately turn it into chemical energy, which makes the sugar. Um, hmm. I'm, okay, I'm not gonna go through, okay, I will go through this slide. So basically, remember the two parts of photosynthesis, you have your first part, the light reactions, and it's just basically when a bunch of chemical reactions happen and ATP is generated, but only a small amount. And then electron acceptors get their electrons. There's an electron transport chain that releases energy. And yeah, the whole thing is based on light. While the carb, the, oops, the Calvin system or the Calvin cycle is anabolic, so it builds stuff up, it actually creates the sugar, and it's also sometimes called the dark reactions because no light is needed. And so basically, glucose is created. All right, here's a diagram. So different plants use different modes of photosynthesis. Not gonna go too much into this because and I didn't touch on the other parts because I don't want to burden you guys.